well, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, I can guess why I was invited to participate in this conference. One of the most difficult security challenges mutually faced by the United Kingdom and Japan is the management of the United States. <laughs> so, and, and having spent three years studying in the UK and three years driving ships in Japan, I suppose I can help you both with this, uh, with this challenge. But more seriously, as a, an American with many colleagues, many friends, both in the United Kingdom and in Japan, I believe it is very important, very positive, that these two allies are rejuvenating their relationship in the security area. And stronger security relationships between these two countries can only have a positive effect for the United States. However, stronger security relationships must go beyond defense security, defense industry cooperation. They have to go on to cooperation in the big security challenges that face us here in East Asia. And that's what I would like to talk about uh, this, af this afternoon. Because renewal and updating of Japanese-UK relations takes place against the backdrop of an extremely dynamic East Asian security landscape. For over three decades, the United States has been the most powerful supporter of the fundamental Asian security architecture that has maintained generally peaceful relations in this part of the world. The security ar architecture, along with the American-led free trade system and open market, has provided the foundation for the phenomenal economic as well as political development, first here in Japan, then in the Asian tigers, spreading to other Asian countries, and most recently to China. It is this economic growth and the corresponding growth in the political weight of this region that will make East Asia a dominant center of the world in the 21st century. However, China's size, its history, and its conception of its role in the region are now posing a challenge to this system that allowed it to develop in the first place. And the key to continued development in this region, development that has hugely benefited China's citizens, is for China to assume a leadership role that maintains this security and economic system, as well as its own continued political and economic development. Robert Zellick's phrase is still accurate. The challenge is for China to become a responsible stakeholder. Now, China has recently changed its government, and changes may be coming in its policies. But let me take a few minutes to describe the important China-related security issues of the past few years. I would say three sets of developments in recent years have been most important. The China-Taiwan relationship, China's assertiveness with its neighbors, and China's domestic economic weaknesses. One of the most striking and positive recent developments has been China-Taiwan relations. As recently as five years ago, Taiwan was the single most important and a very contentious factor in the US-China relationship. It had been so for the previous decade. However, Ma Yingzhou's election in 2008 started a new era in Taiwan-China relations. President Ma's predecessors had tested the limits of both the Taiwanese electorate's support for and the Chinese government's tolerance for steps towards independence. It was clear that the Taiwan Taiwanese people were far more interested in practical steps towards better relationships with China than they were in symbolic gestures that antagonized China. At the same time, China had learned that heavy-handed attempts to intimidate the Taiwanese people with military demonstrations, to blackmail Taiwanese businesses, and endorse specific parties and candidates were counterproductive. Both sides were ready for a new phase in their relations, and President Ma's policy of the three no's no unification, no independence, no use of force, provided a sound basis for a fresh start. And since then, China and Taiwan have made steady 
progress on a series of agreements in transportation, financial, cultural relations that have removed many of the impediments to much better business and personal contact across the Taiwan Strait. It is striking how Taiwan has moved from the central place in China's international concerns to a secondary position. Before 2008, the first half hour of any meeting with a foreign leader with a Chinese official would be devoted to Taiwan. Now there are meetings in which the subject barely comes up. However, this absence of the barking dog is less reassuring than it seems. The issue of sovereignty between Taiwan and China has been postponed. It has not been resolved. According to polling data, the citizens of Taiwan are less and less thinking of themselves as Chinese, and fewer every year actually, actually believe that they are part of China, part of one China. They have no desire to cede to Beijing the influence that, for example, the citizens of Hong Kong have been forced to give up. And China, as it grows in economic and military power, has increasingly believed that others, especially Taiwan, will have to bend to its will. And China, in the future, will be less willing to concede to Taiwan a de jure recognition of the de facto autonomy that it now enjoys. Taiwan is probably willing to put off the discussion of sovereignty indefinitely, but China is not. The other countries in the region, and in fact, other countries around the world, including the UK, need to be thinking through the actions that they would take should China-Taiwan relationship heat back up and resume center stage in China's external strategy. We need to maintain military capability so that China cannot achieve and cannot think that it could achieve its goal of reunification by force. But better yet, the countries in the region should be thinking through a more positive approach than simply waiting and hoping. How can we encourage China and Taiwan to reach a peaceful resolution of their political differences? If the Taiwan issue was surprisingly quiet in recent years, China's relationships with its neighbors in the South China Sea and the East China Sea have been surprisingly confrontational. It was only a decade ago for that China signed the Declaration of Principles for resolving disputes in the South China Sea. And at that time, it made no claims on the, no active claims on the Senkakus. The Chinese claim that it was more aggressive pressing of territorial claims in the South China Sea by Vietnam and the Philippines in particular that derailed peaceful progress of prior years. They claim it was Japanese actions in what they call the Daiwus the arrest of a Chinese fishing boat captain, the purchase of islands by the Japanese government. It was these actions that upped the ante there. Most other countries are convinced that it was China's more aggressive military and diplomatic actions that caused the cycle of confrontation and crisis that we have seen in recent years. However it started, this cycle of military deployments, diplomatic claims, intense media focus, Nationalist statements in all countries has, not, has now been firmly established. Fortunately, so far, all the military actions have been shows of force rather than use of force, but there's always the danger of escalation. China's behavior during this period has been a rude shock to those who believed in its commitment to peaceful development. In Southeast Asia in particular, China's economic and diplomatic strategy before then had generally been admired as masterful. It used its access to its own import market for influence with advanced countries like Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, and generous development projects for the poorer countries like Cambodia and Laos. It sent skilled diplomats into ambassadorial posts who presented the most benign possible picture of China's intentions and actions. In 2002, as I mentioned, it signed a Declaration of Principles for a settlement of maritime disputes in the South China Sea that renounced the use of force in favor of negotiated peaceful settlements. Yet in July of 2010, another face of China showed itself at a meeting of the ASEAN Regional Forum in Hanoi as Prime Minister Yang Zhexi lectured his fellow diplomats in strident tones. China is a big country. Other countries are small countries. That's a fact. Several factors form this different and more aggressive Chinese approach. At the heart of it seemed to be a Chinese idea that rather than its 
interests and its ambitions being limited, they grew commensurately with the growth in China's relative power. By 2010, China had not only weathered the world economic recession, but had assisted other Asian countries to do so. That recession, which had spread to much of the world, had been started by the United States, and the United States and Western Europe had not yet recovered from it. China's GDP had surpassed Japan's, and predictions of the date of its overtaking the United States were shortening. Much of China's military buildup had gone into its navy and its air force in the South China Sea, which was their, their operating area. And the Chinese acted as if this greater economic and military power in Southeast Asia meant that other countries now owed China new concessions on old issues. Even the seasoned and very careful observer, Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore, has said in his most recent book that China's definition of its interests seems to be elastic, seems to be expanding. The reaction of China's neighbors was to band together to oppose Chinese demands, to increase their defense spending and their defense acquisitions, and to turn to the United States for support. Seeing this reaction, China seemed to realize that it had overplayed its hand. State Councilor Dai Bingguo published an authoritative article reiter reiterating China's commitment to peaceful development. President Hu Jintao, in his January 2011 trip to the United States, did the same in all his public statements, and the immediate crisis seemed to pass. Later in 2011, China agreed to develop further the Declaration of Principles for the Settlement of Maritime Disputes in the South China Sea. However, the memories of 2010 remained vivid in the minds of China's neighbors. In addition, Chinese military deployments in the South China Sea, especially near the Philippines and around the Senkaku Daiu Islands, have continued, in fact, have increased in their level and in their aggressiveness. Targeted economic measures against the Philippines, against Japan, against Vietnam have continued. Yang Jiechi, he of the big countries and small countries outburst has replaced Dai Bingguo as the state councillor in Beijing. Now the nature of Chinese future security policies will be determined in large measure by its economic performance. And behind the impressive overall growth numbers of recent years, there are problems arising. China's economic growth began in 1979 when it began, when it opened up to the rest of the world. It followed the path that had already been blazed by its neighbors here in East Asia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, freeing the private sector of the economy, welcoming foreign investment, exporting manufactured goods, and investing in infrastructure. The formula worked well, and it resulted in roughly 10% annual increases in GDP, moving hundreds of millions of Chinese out of poverty and it provided justification for the continuing grip on power of the Chinese Communist Party, which had abandoned both its ideological justification and its responsibility to provide planned and reliable jobs, goods, and social services for its citizens. However, it has become clear to thoughtful Chinese in the last few years that the economic model of the last 30 years has run its course. It has resulted in, in income inequality and corruption that are among the highest in the world and major sources of domestic discontent. It has resulted in damage to the environment, foul air in major cities, polluted waters in many regions. And these arouse citizen anger, calls for action. The foundations of sustaining the old model have been undermined. Wages are rising rapidly throughout China. Those add to the cost of exports. Import markets in the developed world are shrinking and aggressive Chinese policies of indigenous innovation, protection of a low exchange rate for its currency, and the use of punitive economic measures for political purposes are all provoking backlash. Capital expenditures on infrastructure, which was a major component of GDP growth in the past, have exhausted their purpose and are no longer productive. Most economists believe that the state-owned enterprises in, in China are actually destroying value, not creating it. And despite the gains of the past, there are now more Chinese below the poverty line than there were in 1979 when China's opening began. In the face of all these imperatives for change, the Chinese political leadership has grown more conservative, more careful, more slow. It relies on consensus, 
<clears throat> and the circle of those who must give their consent to major policy decisions represent entrenched political and economic interests in the country with large stakes in the current system. It's frankly difficult to imagine another Deng Xiaoping or Zhu, even a Zhu Rongji emerging with the personal stature and with the authority to take the unpopular decisions that are needed to, <clears throat> to shift to a consumption-based economy with a private sector that is growing again, much less to institute the democratic reforms that would root out corruption and inequality in the party and in the country. The Xi Jinping government is attacking high-level production, high-level corruption, excuse me, is attacking maybe high-level production too. <laughs> it, it, it's attacking high-level corruption by well-publicized in, investigations of a few prominent figures, but it's unlikely that this approach will have far-reaching effects. Modest steps like the creation of experimental economic zones in Shanghai will be difficult to scale to translate into structural transformation of the chi Chinese economy. So what happens within the economy, within the domestic governance of China, will be the most important indicator of the course of its future. And those of us in countries that deal with China need to watch it closely. The safe bet is that China will muddle through in the near future with reduced but still significant economic growth slow progress on its many problems. A dramatic shift to consumption-based economic growth, strengthening, strengthening of a more open media and social communication, and the independent rule of law would be welcome. Greater repression to control instability resulting from continued high levels of inequality, corruption, pollution, and lower levels of growth would keep Chinese leadership attention focused at home. Might be useful for its neighbors, but it would be bad for the Chinese people, and certainly the potential for domestic violence and tension within the region is something that we would not hope for. So with this sort of uncertainty about the future of China, the country whose development will play the largest single role in the future of East Asian security architecture, what's the best policy for Japan, for the United States, for the United Kingdom? Our strategy should continue to be a blended set of policies towards China, with an emphasis on the positive. We should continue to do business with China while encouraging it to improve its compliance with WTO norms, especially to protect intellectual property and a shift to a consumption-led economy. China is welcome to join the leadership of international economic and security structures. However, it cannot view its responsibilities in those structures as only benefiting China. It must adopt policies and take action that will allow international business, financial, and trade systems to function for the benefit of all. So this means adjusting China's currency closer to its real value. This means protecting intellectual property of international companies that compete with Chinese champions. This means refraining from using economic measures to intimidate or to retaliate against countries with which China has political disputes. We should continue to encourage China to join the formal and informal international bodies to deal with common concerns from the halting the spread of nuclear weapons to dealing with climate change, to handling North Korea, to ensuring the, flee, the free flow of energy around the world. But at the same time, those whose futures will be affected by China need to maintain relationships such as the US-Japan alliance, the US-UK alliance, along with the military capability to handle China's rapidly growing naval and air capability off its coasts. American and Japanese military capability is not for aggressive purposes, and there's a 50-year record that verifies this assertion. The military power of the United States and its allies in the region have rather deterred the use of military force within the region, allowing for the economic growth that has benefited the countries and peoples out here. However, the future course of China is uncertain, and those who deal with China must have ways to deal with a powerful and aggressive China if it chooses to develop in that direction. I should also emphasize that a related challenge in China, in the United States, in Japan, in the United Kingdom, and elsewhere, none of us should allow worst-case assumptions and mutual suspicion to, to undermine the more positive aspects of our relationships. Prudent military preparations do not mean military containment of China. A hedging strategy is not a ruse for, ag for aggression, and we must continue to make this clear. Now, what is it that the United States expects of longtime allies like Japan and the United Kingdom? From the American point of view, there is simply a limited and pretty small number of countries in the world that feel 
the real responsibility to support the formal and informal agreements, understandings, practices that underlie the world economic and security order from which all nations benefit. There are fewer still that have and are willing to spend diplomatic capital and effort, economic resources, and military deployments in order to support that order. This international order is not a Pax Americana, nor is it the orderly and lawful world envisioned in the UN Charter. It's a much more modest but vital construct in which there are limits on aggressive international behavior, there are limits on brutal domestic behavior, dictators are contained, and on occasion they're removed from power. It's an order in which massive suffering is relieved. On the economic side, it's a general commitment to freer trade, to making compromises in economic disputes in the interests of greater common prosperity. It's an order in which international cooperation is expected to deal with cross-cutting common dangers from global warming and environmental pollution to international drug dealing, international crime. And the United States counts on the United Kingdom as one of the handful of countries that feels the responsibility for supporting these arrangements and for contributing real resources commensurate with its size to addressing these challenges in order to deal with them when they break out. It would like to count on Japan in the same way and there are many hopeful signs that Japan is moving in this direction. Certainly Prime Minister Abe, and I would suspect most of the Japanese attending this conference, favor Japan's development in this direction. But the challenge, of course, is to bring along the entire Japanese people. That's the way it works in democracies. And finally, returning to my opening lighthearted comment, I believe that Japan and the United Kingdom can learn from one another about how best to work with the United States to achieve common goals. For example, American friends of Japan would like Japan to develop the sort of close working relationship with the United States, which the United Kingdom has developed and maintained. Rather, we have developed and maintained it together. Ambassadors and their country teams are working together closely in the world's trouble spots and in the headquarters of international organizations. Military commanders and their staffs and units continually are planning and exercising with American regional commands and headquarters, uh, head headquarters staffs. Intelligence agencies and their American counterparts are continually comparing views of developments in the world, both ongoing and potential. Embassies in each other's capitals are interacting continually with U.S. departments and agencies across the full range of issues. Counterpart officials in Tokyo, London, Washington are in constant direct communication with their counterparts. In short, Japan should develop this dense and routine set of relationships with Washington and London based on a common view of the world's challenges and a commitment to work on them together. So let me conclude by summarizing a few major points and then we can turn to comments and questions. Since the end of the post-colonial wars in Southeast Asia in the mid-1970s, East Asia has experienced a period of amazing economic and political development that has enormously benefited all of the, season, all of the citizens of this region and, in fact, many others around the world. Enabling, underlying that development has been a security framework led in large measure by the United States, consisting of defensive alliances, deployed military forces, and these arrangements have deterred the use or the threat of the use of force within the region. China's economically, economic and more recently its military development have been enabled by that same security framework. But China's power and influence have meant that it now can now challenge and shape that framework. Future success depends on China assuming a stronger leadership role in the region while maintaining the security and well-being of its neighbors so that there can be a broad-based development. The United States, Japan, and the United Kingdom should help China assume that role while ensuring the capability to protect their interests and this system in case China adopts a more aggressive course. The United States and the United Kingdom should assist Japan to develop the network of cooperative ties that enable them to maintain a secure and prosperous world by working together effectively on dealing with the many issues that arise in a dynamic 21st century world. So to the Saskawa Peace Foundation, the Royal United Services Institute, thank you very much for inviting me to listen in on your discussions. And I very much look forward to your comments and to your questions. Thank you.